So the number one application that's used is Office, and this is sort of the typical process. Now, what you have here is a simplified picture, but you have ERP systems, a consolidation application, okay? Then you have a process here that occurs in Microsoft Word or Excel. Now, the supplemental data idea there, that is political correctness for spreadsheet hell, okay? <laughs> And if that was drawn to scale, it would overwhelm the, the slide, okay? It would just overwhelm the slide. But that's where a lot of manual activity occurs because not all of your information is in here, okay? It's over here or it's in Excel worksheets over there. So there's a lot of manual activity that occurs with respect to assembling your information. Now, just to give you an idea, these are some of the basic processes that you do manually. So what linear document review, it's a very simple concept. Here's a report, I'd like you to review it. Yes, I'd like you to look at all the tax disclosures. So what are you doing? You're playing Where's Waldo. I've gotta go find all these tax disclosures. Now, the other thing that's occurring, the idea of distributed document review, you guys are my review committee, so I'm gonna send each one of you a Word document and ask you to send me back your comments. That's gotta be fun for whoever's receiving them. Okay, now I've been in these companies where that Johnny person literally has a stack of manual papers that he's going through for literally 48 hours to version all the changes people want him to make. The other thing is manual assembly. There's the two processes. There's the debits and credits that are in here that very simply come into Word, balance sheet and P&L, but then there's all the other stuff that comes through the supplemental data process. MDNA, all my note disclosures, et cetera. Now, I'm giving you this in the context of an annual report, but it's just the same thing for a management report. It's just the same thing for any kind of custom report. So anything an accountant's doing, you basically are looking at the same processes. Think about a board package, an audit committee package. Anything you're assembling has these two functions to it. And again, they're done separately, and then they're manually assembled there. Um, and then, of course, if you want something from the back-end systems, you gotta get an email or a phone going because you don't have the ability from your position to actually query those ERP systems unless you understand SQL like the gentleman in the back row over there. So this process is classic in most companies today, and this picture was actually drawn by the controller of the largest Hyperion implementation in the world, United Technologies Corporation. A guy named John Stanchel drew this picture and he, he published an article in the Journal of Accountancy in 2007 called the ROI and XBRL, where he outlined these processes. Now, it's not only that bad, but once you get it into Word, then you also have the same information in HTML. These are two separate documents. So if you make a change, you've got to make the change a couple of times. Now we add XBRL to that. I need an XBRL document. Now we have three documents to change. And if you change net income, you're back to playing Where's Waldo, trying to find those changes, okay? Now we've all done a version where somebody wants to change a number at the last minute, and that ripples through not only our financial statements, but our board package, our audit committee package, press release, blah, blah, blah. That's the problem. So here's what's changing, is there's a, a, a new idea called disclosure management. And it simply is a report writer on steroids, okay? And is a new piece of software, it's a report writer, and what it does is two things. One, it connects to my source information, and two, it connects to an XBRL taxonomy on the internet. Now, those mapping activities are a new idea, because now I can sit in my report and pull the information I need, like I explained earlier. It's a pull supply chain, not a push supply chain. So in the past, the software's been giving you the reports and you had to deal with them. The new model is you decide what you want and then you pull that into your report. And that's what these disclosure management applications allow you to do. The mappings, and there's a bell curve of features here, and I'm gonna cover those in a minute, but the mappings can be reasonably automated, okay? They don't have to be manual. Some of the applications are still have very manual features, but the more advanced ones have very automated features. What it allows you to do, though, under contextual review, 
What that means is the gentleman here who's going to look at the tax disclosures, he can say to this Word document, hey, I'd like to see all the tax disclosures as a view. Because everything in the back end is structured like a barcode. So it's like going to the grocery store and think about the grocery store being all intangible products, not physical. So it's like going to the grocery store and having your grocery list and just hitting the data refresh button and all those products adhere to your grocery list like that. That's what we're talking about. So I can say to the report, show me all the tax disclosures. I can look at them as a context. I have my disclosure checklist, a much more efficient review process. The second one here, collaborative review, is no different than a Google Doc or a Wikipedia page. So rather than sending all of my Word documents to all of you, I would invite you to come and review this collaboratively. Now, I can make sure that you guys don't see taxes because that's these guys over here. And you guys get to see Treasury, and you guys don't get to see taxes. So there's administrative controls. Um, but the idea is collaboration. So here's what that means in practical terms. Two basic ideas. Number one, you and I are now looking at the tax disclosure together. You can see my edits. I can see yours. I'm screwing it up. You call me. You tell me, hey, Mike, I got this. You're screwing it up. I'm, I'll cover it. Well, in the old model, you couldn't see my edits until three or four days later. And so what that simple idea allows people to take a versioning cycle that's usually measured in days down to something they can measure in hours. Okay, That's the, that's the compression from days to hours, typically 8 to 12. So you can literally version a document in 8 to 12 just because you've improved transparency and allowed people to see it. The second thing about collaborative review um, is that we can collaborate on this and we can begin to share those concepts, those business rules. So some of those analytics that I mentioned in the cloud, those can be applied to these reports over and over. So does my, do my assets work? Does my totals work? Those business rules can be applied to reports over and over again. Those analytical concepts can be flushed through my systems. So think of it this way. Um, those models can be reused as a check against my, my reports. The automated assembly, that's now coming through a single process. Those Excel worksheets are actually in the report writer. They look and smell like the Dyson version of Excel. So my tax department is able to create a provisioning worksheet that is sucking the data out of the systems into their provisioning model. They're no longer manually assembling all that. Once they set it up the first time, it sucks the data into that model, and off they go. So there's an incentive for not only Johnny, the person assembling the report, but everybody that works on assembling information to use these kind of applications because they facilitate the automated assembly of the information. Back to the Dyson version of Excel. And I'm using Excel as a proxy here. That same thing works in Word, in PowerPoint, in all of your basic desktop applications. They're now able to consume the information. The automated aggregation, same basic idea, but I can pull it from deeper areas. And I can also pull it from external sources. So all software vendors are going to talk to you about getting all of your data into their software application. What if you could actually consume somebody else's data? So a company like Cigna, as part of their report drafting process, they point their disclosure management application at Edgar. They pull in their peer group for risk assessments. So even the tax guys who are doing their provision, that disclosure is being benchmarked over here in the Excel worksheet on columns A through AA on the far right hand side. They're looking at their 10 peers data as part of their drafting process because it just takes a few seconds to pull that data out of Edgar into their model. So it's peer benchmarking, it's risk assessment at the drafting level. Okay? That's a new idea. In the past, if you ask a company, how do you do benchmarking, they would say, well, the college intern. You know, I do it once a summer when I hire the college intern. This is something that gets built into the process that happens every time they open that worksheet. So the idea here is it's not only about your data, you can actually consume other people's data that's publicly available. And I mentioned about the automation of the ledgers. 
that also happens. Now, the punchline here is that companies are pulling 25 to 50 percent of the cost and time out of the reporting process. Okay, so United Technologies, largest Hyperion implementation in the world, they reduced the cost and time of their reporting by 25 percent. Okay, now they were very sophisticated their starting place. A company that wasn't as sophisticated in their starting place might be eBay, eBay, the market company. So if you go on, to, on the internet and you look at eBay and XBRL, you'll find a case study that says that eBay reduced their reporting cycle per quarter by 20 days. Two zero. 20 days. That's the kind of cost and time reduction we're talking about here. Why? Because they automated the processes and controls they'd previously been doing manually. Okay. Now let me just give you a simple example. How do you know your balance sheet foots? How do you know? Because you refoot it. You pull out a 10 key and you refoot it, right? How do you know it ties out to your inventory note? Because you go and look at it manually. So in, in my day, we call that ticking and tying or blue checking. The blue checking because we had a blue pen and we'd have to make the little marks next to all those numbers to indicate we checked them. Well, here, that is automated. If the report doesn't foot, if it doesn't tie out, the report will tell you that. Hey, I don't tie out to the inventory note. Come fix me. Think about that idea. So the company controller gets a benefit. The internal auditor gets a benefit. Your external audit fees go down because those guys aren't sending it to Indy and having somebody blue check it over there. It just happens automatically. It's no different than your consolidation system. No one's checking that. They're looking at your controls, making sure they're adequate. But nobody's going back in and manually redoing that because you systematized it. Same idea here. Once you systematize this, you're able to automate it and streamline those process controls. So the 25 to 50%, this is not only relevant to your reports you're sending to the SEC, this is relevant to every report you produce because every report you produce, you're doing the same kind of manual assembly. So to give you a scale at this, United Technologies put a case study out on the internet where they went out and actually quantified how many reports they were producing manually. When they got to 100,000, they stopped counting. Okay, So 25% cost reduction for 100,000 reports, that's a big cost savings. Now, that's a big company, but you yourself may not have that many. You may have less. It's still the same kind of impact. Any questions so far? I'm going to take a breath. Uh, one question. Yes, sir. Finance. Driven by finance, um, in some cases the IT companies aren't even involved. Um, some of the solutions I'll show you in a minute are actually cloud solutions. I see IT involved only when it's a client server idea where they have to put it in the infrastructure. The only, the only reason I ask is if you're in a financial group, but, but company creates all types of data, mm -hmm. it, it needed for management, and we're applications. Right. So there is a collaboration here and it's part of actually introducing this. In the example of Fujitsu that I gave earlier, where they standardized 157 ERP systems, that was actually driven by the global CIO at Fujitsu. But that's a much more holistic idea. This is typically a reporting concept that's driven by the Director of Reporting Controller's Office in that area. Now, this is a graph that shows you how quickly this is occurring. So literally um, a couple years ago, you had 100 companies that were doing this. Today, you have over 2,100. So in the last 12 months or so, you've had 2,000 companies implement these disclosure management applications. Now, I've looked at these, a lot of these, and again, there's a bell curve in terms of implementations. You have United Technologies, you have a Cigna, you have an eBay, who have case studies on the internet that talk about their success. And it's because they've done a very social, inclusive idea. There's other companies you don't hear about where they gave it to the webmaster and they said, we'd like you to implement this. The webmaster meaning a single person. And then they say, well, where's our cost savings? Well, they didn't change their business processes. So there's no cost savings, okay? That's the juxtaposition here. So this gives you an idea of the dramatic. What I think is driving this is largely the SEC mandate 
because companies outsource this, the idea of expiral tagging. They outsourced it, but when they get to the second year where they have to detail tag all their, their notes, that's a burden that's just not sustainable on an outsourcing model. Okay? But this, again, again, is why you should pay attention to history class. When the barcode was first introduced in the grocery store, how did it get on the products? Inventory clerks in the stores put the barcodes on the products when they stocked the shelves. That's no different than what the companies did in outsourcing. Well, today, if you saw an inventory clerk in a grocery store putting a barcode on, you'd kind of wonder what was going on because it's put on at the source. And that's, of course, what Fujitsu did. So supply chain standardization typically starts at the end of the supply chain and works backwards. So what we're seeing here is the end of the supply chain beginning to standardize. That's what we're seeing here. So you will follow this in the IMA world with a wave of companies pushing this back against their ERP systems as they begin to understand the ramifications. Now, here's some of the vendors and tools. Um, I don't make any comments in terms of which is the best one. They all have pros and cons. They all have strengths and weaknesses. But on the left-hand side, the built-in applications, those are the companies that we see most often uh, companies considering. What do they cost? Um, they're based upon the size of the company. That's how the licenses work. Revenues and number of employees. So it really depends on the size of the company. Um, I will tell you that the implementation time frame is typically an evolutionary idea. Um, some companies do big bang where they'll knock it in and say three to six weeks. But most companies will do a state approach where they might you know, train people over a period of months and implement the reports on an evolutionary basis. So a company like Cigna, um, they actually started with their Ks and Qs, and then uh, two years later, they had like 50 or 60 reports who were blowing through this, including internal accounting memos. So it's not just about external stuff, it's anything you have to aggregate data on would be beneficial. Um, public, public companies in the audience? Okay, so if you're supporting uh, the XBRL, um, you know, you're liable for material errors, and, and all that. And in XBRL, the, these are analytical tools that will allow you to see the errors that are in your report. If you are not using one of these analytical tools effectively, you are probably got material errors in your reports. So I'm going to use the word probably. I'm going to define what the definition of probably is. The definition of probably is, is. You do have errors in your report, OK? <laughs> Now, I, I looked at the top 20 companies in the U.S. last November, and I was able to find negative values, numbers were backwards, in every one of them. I was able to find calculation errors in every one of them. I was able to find metadata errors in every one of them. I'm talking 100% here, okay? So the analytical tools are basically an, an, a way for you to see things that you can't see otherwise. Um, the review process that most people follow is they look, they, the printers or whoever they big give them a report. We're back to, here's the software, here's your report. Here's your report. Here's your report. So it's a haystack. You get an Excel worksheet that has literally 3,000 rows and two dozen columns. That's a haystack. These analytical tools are the equivalent of a five-ton magnet. I can pull the needles out of the haystack and look at them like this. That's all it is. It's very simple. The price tag on these guys is typically free for something like RL to $2,500 for the most expensive one up there. And it's everything in between. So they're, they're a different price than the, the built-ins. But if you're a public company, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at the analytical tools because um, I think it would help you minimize your risk. Now, a natural question would be, well, Mike, if I buy one of these, aren't those analytical capabilities in here? The answer is yes, if you ask these guys. And what I'm telling you is no, they're not there. You know, the software guys are going to tell you, yeah, we have a report for that. We have a report for negative values. So here's the analogy. Ten years ago, if you bought a car and you want a GPS, they would say, well, get a Garmin and suction cup it to the windshield. Okay? That's what we have today here. These are the car manufacturers. You need to get a Garmin and suction cup it to the windshield. Now, today, if you buy a car and you want GPS, it's in the dash because it's more mature. 
Well, in, in I'd say the next three or four years, these guys will have those features built into the dash for you. But today, they're not there. It's typical software development. It's early versions. So if you don't have one of those tools, I'd highly recommend you get one. Um, there's a whole range of features there. It's a bell curve. I'm going to talk to you about some of the differentiating features in just a second. These are some of the implementation considerations. These are the key drivers in terms of how you get the biggest bang for the benefit. The first one is the social process. If you give it to the Johnny, the webmaster, the one person implementation, you're not going to get the bang. So you have to create as many people using these applications as possible because, as I said earlier, the tax guys are going to get just as big a benefit out of assembling their information as you are out of assembling the report. Um, the automation enabling a flow through a source. So whenever something in the source updates, you want that to flow through to your reports. And so the, the more that you have that occurring, the more you're going to benefit. So it's not just about your Ks and Qs. It's literally about any report you generate. Validation rules. This is where your, your report blue checks itself. Does my report work? Does the math all work? I can even put risk assessments in there. Okay, and that's this concept here. Comparative analysis of peer disclosures. I can build that into my drafting process. Now, why is that important? I mean, we've all been doing benchmarking for a long time, but why am I hyping on that? I've mentioned it twice. Well, here's why. Okay? The Soviet Union has nuclear weapons. You guys have bows and arrows. All right? The SEC is using the XBRL data and social analytical processes to interrogate every single report that comes in the door. Now, in the old pre-XBRL world, they would statistically sample reports under Sarbanes-Oxley once every three years and review them manually, which meant you were sort of based upon the, the analysts that you were, you know, got that choose, chose your report. Today, every report that goes into Edgar is running through a series of these analytical nets looking for disclosure anomalies down at the granular level. So if your discount rate for your defined benefit plan is outside of the bell curve of your peers, it's going to get flagged like that. If your tax rate is going the wrong way for your income model, it's going to get flagged for review. And it's not the intellectual property of one analyst. It's the intellectual property of 250 analysts who are collaborating using the social analytical tools at the SEC. Now, the SEC hired a guy two years ago named Craig Lewis, which is irrelevant except his background is a predictive modeling expert. This is a guy with multiple PhDs from Vanderbilt. He is the chief economist at the SEC today, and he is using big data and analytics, which you're going to hear about in a minute, to interrogate and analyze your reports. So the reason I am hyping this, if you're a public company, is doing your risk assessments before you publish your report is a really good idea today because it's going to get interrogated by the SEC and by the analyst community who are now using this data. I think I've talked about um, most of the other items that are on here in the prior slide. Some of the differentiating features of the applications are here. The first one is, is, the, is it on the web, is it a cloud platform, or is it client server? Do I install it? Um, people have different levels of risk. Some people are happy with that. Um, some are not. Does it connect to my backend systems? Is it interoperable? Can it consume XBRL? Can I point it at Edgar and consume that data? Okay. Even if I'm a private company, wouldn't I like to be able to consume a bunch of public segment information to figure out what's going on in the marketplace, do risk assessments? Does it allow me to manage different presentation concepts? So can I take this object, let's say it's my segment uh, information for my P&L, and can I reuse that in my board package, in my audit committee package, or do I have to recreate it? How flexible is it with presentation concepts? If you remember that chemical element looking slide, one of the things that XBRL standardizes is presentations. So think about a YouTube video that's a presentation template. So I can take a presentation idea and I can use it anywhere I want. That's what we're talking about when I talk about presentation management. Reference management has to do with connectivity to other things that I think are important. Company policies, 
company procedures, subject matter experts, maybe even documents like accounting, um, key accounting issues and memos. You know, a lot of that's based up here. You can now begin to connect it in a sustainable way in your infrastructure. I talked earlier about report analytics support. This relates to your international operations. So if you're a public company and you want support for multiple languages, how does this application help you do that? Now, some of you who are private companies may have been tuning me out a little bit with respect to this topic. Here's where I want you to really pay attention, and I'm going to ring your bell in a second. But this idea is just like the internet. So it's not just about the SEC. It's about regulatory bodies in any country that you're operating in. And I'm going to cover that in just a second. But this is very important because this is not just an SEC idea. This is relevant to 250 agencies all over the world today, and that's growing. Um, does it support this idea here, inline XBRL? Because that's what most regulators around the world use. This is where the SEC is going. The SEC staff has several projects to figure out the implementation of inline XBRL. What is inline XBRL, Mike? Today you have two reports you file with the SEC, an HTML document and an XBRL document. We're going to cover in just a second which one of those two documents analysts use. That's a different topic. But today you have two documents. XBRL inline, IXBRL, takes those two and pushes them together as one idea. So the human being sees HTML, the machine sees XBRL. It's the best of both worlds. And that's why it's used by other regulators around the world. So when you buy an application, you want to make sure that it supports this because you'll need it in the UK and Japan in the Netherlands and other places, but you'll also need it here very soon. Taxonomy management, I want to be able to use different taxonomies like US GAAP or IFRS or UK in a report together. Mapping wizards. For most of you who've been outsourcing it, this idea of mapping has been a very painful process. So here's the analogy. I cannot spell at all. My mother is an English teacher. So go back in time to when I was small and had dark hair. And you would have this scenario. Mom, how do you spell? Look it up. That's what she'd say, look it up. Mom, I don't know how to spell it. How can I find it in the dictionary? <laughs> she said, well, you know where sympathy is, right? Yeah, got it. So when somebody gives you the US GAAP taxonomy, that's like me, my mom, giving me the dictionary, right? Look it up. Here's this huge listing of things that you're manually going through. So I write articles all the time. And are there any misspellings in any of the articles that I write? No, heck no. Why? Spell checker, right. There is a dictionary that sits on my shoulder and looks at everything I type, and it makes suggestions as to what should be right. That's a taxonomy mapping wizard. Okay? It should look at what you're typing and make a suggestion as to what you should use. And the more advanced ones, run out to Edgar, and they look at your peer group, and they put a percentage there that say, here's the percentage of your peers that are using this element. Okay, So now you got the internet, spell checker mapping helping you. That's a differentiating feature. For many of the applications, they're immature in certain features. This is a priority listing of what I think you should talk to them about for their roadmap. So if you're looking at a disclosure management application, these are features that you need to have that they may not have. So the question is, when are you going to support these? And the number one you see is query analytics. So I'm back to, when are you going to put GPS in the dash? Because as far as I'm concerned, my report quality is number one. I need to be able to do that with your, your tool, not with somebody else's tool. What's the ROI? How long does this take? Here's a formula that would help you figure out your ROI. Okay? These are some examples of licensing cost implementation, but also some benefits. And it has to do with the number of reports that you can push through this process and to automate and manually, and how quick a time can you do that? Okay, you're obviously not going to take 100,000 reports and go from manual to automated in three weeks. But in five years, or six years, you might could do that. And that's a big benefit to you.